Welcome to Gutting the Sacred Cow Podcast, the most unique and hilarious movie review and movie debate podcast out there. Why? Because no one's doing what I'm doing. No one's inviting guests to pick a film they find overrated or hate and trying to convince the guests to see their argument. But of course, the criteria being why they beloved, critically acclaimed, or financial success. Duh. This week, Scotty Landis comes on and... Surprise, kids. It only took 200 some episodes to get the first Wes Anderson film, but Scotty Landis comes on to come on and to dissolve the Royal Tenenbaums. Scotty, who wrote The Machine, you know, the movie with Burt Kreischer, wants to come on and explain why the Royal Tenenbaums, all you Wes Anderson nerds, he's going to tell you are wrong. And this is your crown jewel. Guess what? We're going to find out if I'm right or he's right or if you're right or if anybody's right that the Royal Tenenbaums should be dissolved and ignored. My name's Elliot, and I'm with the Cub Scouts of America. We're selling uncut cocaine to get to the Jamboree. Scotty Landis, name that film. Oh, no. I should know this. Uh, t- damn. I don't know. So I, I'll just take a horrible guess, and I'll say... Um, uh, I'll say, uh, stand by me. <laughs> no, sir, that is not correct. The film, a little 1993, I believe yeah, it is. Film called True Romance. Oh, yes, True Romance. I don't think I've seen it since about 93. <laughs> it's a goddamn hoot. Kevin Goatee, Scotty Landis joining us from the Bananas Podcast. Scotty, how goes it, buddy? What's new and exciting with you? It's great. I'm doing well. I'm in sunny Los Angeles. The writer's strike is ending. And um, I wrote a movie in 2020 that is now out on Netflix and it is number one on Netflix for the third day in a row. So which is the, the machine. I wrote you wrote the machine. machine. Mm-hmm. Oh, I that I added that for my plane ride to Vegas on Friday. I shit oh, cool. you not. Well, it's good. Goes well with drinking. Well, be plenty of that. Scotty has chosen a film, but boy, is it going to piss off the nerds. And when you piss off nerds and hipsters, I'm here for it. 2001, The Royal Tenenbaums. A budget at the time of $41 million. A box office haul at the time, $71 million. Turn that into 2023 money. I did. Mm-hmm. $71 million budget. $123 million box office haul. Modest, okay. modest success. Yeah, pretty good. Pretty no one's good getting success. No one's getting fired over green lighting this one. Not Scott Rudin. IMDB, fellas and ladies, is a scale one through ten with decimal points. Scotty, what do you think the Royal Tenenbaum scored in the old IMDB? I think critics do love this movie. So I will say eight point. I'll say 8.3. 7, 6. Oh, that is a little lower than I would have guessed, actually. I bet you round that up. That's an 8. That's an yeah. 8. Critics, Rotten Tomatoes, 1 through 100. Scotty, since you wrote a movie, you know how this game works. What do you think the Shut critics, up. what do you think the critics gave the Royal Tenenbaums? Oh, I would say they were high. So I'll go, I'll just roll with what I had. I'll say they gave it an 83. Close, 81. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, how about the audience Rotten Tomato score? Um, I would guess it's lower because I think that this movie's polarizing. I think people either think it's their favorite movie or they they hate it. So I'll say 50%. 89. Damn. Boy, was I wrong. I'm more surprised that critics was lower than the audiences because yes. this is the quintessential wet dream for critics. Quotes? None. I found nothing in this film quotable. There's, there, there are some quotes in here that I've heard people say in life, like, and that's fine. Uh, the 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 sort of the bigger ones and sort of the racist ones, so yeah, like the Coltrane line and that sort of thing. I love the exchanges where Royals talking to Chaz's kids, and he says, um, "How often does your dad have you working out?" And the little kid says, 16 times a week." That's I had two laughs in this whole movie, and that was one of them. And then I like the exchange with the Wilson brothers where it's like, I'm sorry, don't listen to me. I'm on mescaline. I've been spaced out all day. Did you say you're on mescaline? I did indeed, very much so. 
Mm. Uh, it's a good exchange. And they, the brothers have chemistry. So those are the only two that popped up for me. Wouldn't that just be an absolute kick in the nuts if the two brothers did not have chemistry in this film? I know. That would be the worst. Uh, and then there's always the quote people do about it's um, it's Eli Cash. It's, his, it's that character saying, like, we all know he lost at the battle of whatever little round top or big horn or whatever but this uh surmises that he didn't or whatever mm -hmm. and our custer custer's loss and i'm like yeah i guess that i get it that's funny it's uh, it, it sounds like it was like a, yeah i was just gonna say a huh, laugh five fun facts, five fun facts. Fun facts. Fun facts. during filming Richie's pet falcon Mordecai got lost in the city and claimed by a random citizen. The person offered a ransom to return the bird upon payment, but the crew was forced to move on. There wasn't enough time to handle the ransom and still meet filming schedules, so they tracked down another bird. This is why Mordecai's appearance oh. shifts at the end of the movie. And with more white feathers than before, Royal and Richie even acknowledged the change within the dialogue. The, yes. fi the fictional bird ended up being played by three different falcons as well as a hawk. Worth it. I mean, absolutely worth the effort. You know, that's like having all those different bows of the clowns in different cities with different franchises. The you message is there, but it's still a little, yeah. a little different. That's right. That's exactly right. The first time I ever worked on a TV show, I was a PA. I was just a production assistant, and it was Stella on Comedy Central. And the first shot had pigeons, and all three of the picture pigeons flew up to the rafters and didn't come down the whole day. So they just had to cut the bit that he was talking to a pigeon. So don't put birds in your script. Yeah, I was going to say they don't they don't act well. You can't train them. Plus, when they fly the rafters, I was expecting you to say they sat in the rafters and this shit all over the set. I'm sure they did. <laughs> Number two, when the camera closes in on Chaz's hand to show the BB still lodged between his knuckles, that wasn't Ben Stiller's hand. Mm. Accidentally, Owen Wilson shot his brother, Andrew, who also wrote the script, in the hand. The BB has been stuck in his knuckles since, and that was his hand shown in that shot. Mm. Scintillating. That is. Good luck getting through TSA. That's cool. <laughs> some people exactly some people say i shrapnel from normandy this guy's like well i don't think that's <laughs> much of an interesting texas. story yeah yeah i don't even know they sold bb guns in texas i just thought they jumped to the real thing right if it's on an m16 or above guys you're just mm -hmm. a pussy yeah <laughs> It's located the house. The lo it's located a 144th and convent in New York City. The production used both the exterior and interior of the house for the movie. The only interior of the house in the movie that is not from the real life location is the kitchen scene between Royal and Henry Sherman, which was shot in the house next door because it had windows. Duh. There you go. They actually have a plaque at Forest Hill Stadium where they play the U.S. Open that says this is where the bomber had his meltdown. Hmm. That's cool. I mean, that is the bomber is probably the most memorable character from this. You do see him well, every Halloween. Somebody whips out a bomber. I'd rather them whip out a Unabomber. Waka, Waka, Waka. I'm cool with it. Number five. This is this one. I love these kind of uh, did you knows. Steven Soderbergh's Ocean's Eleven films would have had a different cast if it was not for the Royal Tenenbaums. Mm. Danny Glover, Luke Wilson. And Owen Wilson all turned down parts to be in Ocean's Eleven instead for this film. Wow. Well, I mean, Ocean's Eleven's pretty damn good. Has anybody taken that down on your pod yet? Yes. One, yes. So Ocean's Eleven. 12, I would not allow. 13, I enjoy the shit out of that one. Yeah, okay. But the thing is, you're turning down. A, I mean, how would you know it was going to be spawned in two, two different sequels as opposed to taking this? That's true. But, if I'm uh, if I'm one of those guys, I roll the dice with Clooney and Brad Pitt and so Good call. Good call. Well, let's get the fans in on the fun. You know what time it is. Game time, fool. Ask a gutter. Not many. That's it. You're the gutter. That's who it is. Everyone who sits in that chair, you're the gutter. Fine with me. For that show, you're the, the mole. Well, you're the mole. No. I do remember that show with Stephen Baldwin. It was on the American version and... What a show. What a great time for that was like the last strike. Reality TV took over and we all became sadder. <laughs> did Stephen Baldwin wear the same Kangol hat he wore in other films? I wish he did. 
I don't know. Yeah. That's a good question. By the way, we just did Blade on this podcast. I thought it was, in fact, Stephen Baldwin who got dragged to the club by Tracy Lords. It's not. But it sure looked like him. Oh. At Bango2331, a chance to shit on a Wes Anderson film. Kevin Goatee is already champing at the bet. Maybe. Maybe not. At Taco Shirt Krillin, I used the quote. I did indeed. Very much so. From yeah. this movie all the time. His question. Are there any obscure movie quotes that you frequently use despite nobody knowing what you're referencing? Ooh, that's an interesting one. I don't. Well, yes, I guess I do. Um, there is an extremely there's a edited out clip from American movie where Mark Borchardt uh, is going to Burger King to buy a Whopper because he found out that they were flame broiled, but they used to have pepsi products and he fucking hates pepsi products and then he finds out that they're going to carry coke and the whole thing is in a drive-thru of american movie and it didn't make the final cut of the movie for whatever reason and every time the drive-thru employee at burger king hands him a different thing so like his change back or a straw or the burgers he, he just keeps saying very cool very cool thank you sir oh that's cool thank you very cool sir so uh, the, whenever my friends and I are like exchanging things to each other, we will just say like, oh, very cool. Thank you, sir. And that's it. And I don't think anybody outside of the American movie uh, universe would ever notice that we were saying anything. But very cool. Thank you, sir. It's just it's a cute clip. It's on YouTube. My question is, what's worse? But the fact Burger King did, in fact, sell Pepsi products or the goddamn <laughs> Whopper jingle. The, the new Whopper Whopper, yes. mine, yeah. yeah, that is pretty bad. That is an earworm. But you remember all the ones, you know, when we were kids, there were so many things that stick with you. So they needed their generational, the YouTube gen needed their own Whopper song. They needed a song that was good. Yeah, I will true. I will give you a, a film that I quote. My brother and I, and maybe about three other people in this fine country have seen. I implore all of you to watch it. I've said it before a million times in this podcast, but I'm going to tell you for the first time, Scotty Landis, a 1991 film called Brain Donor, starring none other than John Turturro, Bob Nelson, right. and Nancy Marchand, who played Tony Soprano's mom. Have you seen this film? Are you familiar no, with it? No, I have never seen that. It is an hour and a half of just sheer hilarity. It's a watered-down night, uh, night at the opera, but okay. God damn, if I see John Turturro in the film, on the streets, I'm sorry, I'm not. I'm stopping him. I'm like, dude, fuck rounders. Brain donors is your tour de force, and I can't wait to see his reaction going, oh, you're the one who saw this. Watch that <laughs> film. It's hilarious. It's also written... Uh, by the guys who did Naked Gun. So that gives you an idea. Oh, okay. Next, at Rex Crum, assuming you can get Wes Anderson to retire from directly overly twee movies. I'm reading verbatim. I don't know what the hell that means. That only appeal to hipsters from and San Francisco. What other job would he be qualified for? Rex, you need to work on your editing skills. You're a goddamn journalist. I know that. So what would you get him to say to retire from to do instead of directing? I think he would be incredible at running a uh, cereal manufacturing plant. I think that the aesthetic that he has is very whimsical and it could easily go into repackaging breakfast cereals for children, maybe designing new marshmallows for Lucky Charms. Mm -hmm. I think I could see him as a Willy Wonka type of General Mills pretty easily. Excellent. That is a hell of an off the cuff thought. I've given this none thought, but except for these two answers I have, <laughs> would be he would be the best, like the local branch manager of an urban outfitters. Oh now, man. Also the snarkiest of snarky Barnes and Noble employees where someone would walk in and go, Where's your fiction section? And you'd see his lip turn up to a sneer and go, Yeah, that way. Bookstore is a great any bookstore, independent or Barnes and Noble. That's a great. He's the daytime manager of a bookshop. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. As he shuffles over and disgust his uh, rolled up jean shorts, rolled up jeans, the cuffs. That's so funny. I love that. That is so accurate. Thank you. Next question at pedestrian, pedestrian at best. I like this shit, LOL. It's one of my favorite films and def his best work, even if I prefer Rushmore. Not a statement, but just more sort of a comment. <laughs> yeah. 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 The, people go, just people just get the other statements. That's cool. We Fine. like you nonetheless. All right. Rushmore, though. Have you seen that? Yeah, I like Rushmore. I Rushmore's like Rushmore more than Tanner Moss. You don't say. 
<laughs> yeah. What a shocker. Yeah. It's uh, I, if I had uh, between the two, yeah, I'd ro- I'd watch Rushmore ten times instead of Royal one more time. Rushmore more and ten of bombs less noted. Okay, let's. Hey, listen. By the way, Scotty, a little fun fact: no one listens to the end of podcast, so we do our plugs in the beginning. Cool. Why don't you shout out what you're up to, kind sir? Sure. So I am the co-host of the Bananas podcast, which is a strange news and storytelling podcast where we have great guests. We've had people like Charlize Theron and Phoebe Bridgers. We have lots of comedians. Uh, it's really, really fun. And I, I co-host it with a comic named Kurt Brownoller. Hmm. It's out every Tuesday. And then because of the strike, yeah, check out The Machine. It's on Netflix now. You can watch it for free. Or if you October's coming around. So if you watch scary movies in October, which a lot of people do. I wrote the movie Ma, and it's usually on FX in October for you to watch and so you don't have to drink alone. Excellent. The thought of watching Burt Kreischer take a shirt off while watching a plane is going to be a weird excuse for me to kind of stumble down the aisle and masturbate <laughs> in the bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any excuse. Right? Of course, guttingthesacredcow at gmail.com if you want to say hi to us. Guttingthesacredcow.com to pick up some fine-ass swag, a mug, a hat, a shirt whatevs at gtsc podcast most importantly though for all of our new fans and friends if you have not yet done so leave us that coveted five-star rating two or three sentence review on your podcast platform of choice because you know i love to take screenshots post some of my favorite reviews and it's just a nice little warming it warms the cockles as the as the kids say that'll do it for the plugs scotty landis why don't we just mosey on right down to contestants row to do what you're gonna do i'm pretty sure in an admirable fashion and that of course is gut the sacred cow oh, that's the way to jump in there um i'm more than happy to do this first of all i discovered last night while i was re-watching this film and i have to thank you because I've, I've actually never finished this movie so last night was the first time i ever watched this movie till the very end and it didn't make it any better for me so that's it, it didn't <laughs> affect this review whatsoever okay so the, my feeling for the royal tenon bombs is the first six minutes and 43 seconds are fantastic. I think that the kids being these really special kids that have all these gifts and interests uh, with their sort of degenerate dad, Royal, and then their caring, thoughtful, teaching mother, Ethel, Ethelene. Mm-hmm. I love that. I was watching that movie. I'm like, I love this movie. But as soon as they let Mordecai fly, and as soon as he takes off and it becomes that, that, that classic Wes Anderson, here are all the characters and their names. The movie all becomes one tone and one uh, energy level for the next hour and 40 whatever minutes. I The whole time I kept thinking like how much more fun it is. And then you have a scene later where Royal is with Chaz's two boys. And I love that part. I was like, this is great. He's teaching them to steal. They're stealing milk. They're running around town. They were riding horses at some point. I'm like, I love that dynamic of these are protected children and then their lunatic grandfather. So yeah, those two things were actually cruel to me because they Mm -hmm. showed me what this joyful, fun, great movie about a dysfunctional family could be. Instead, Wes Anderson went in another direction. Um, And like I said, the two quotes I mentioned were the only two times I laughed. I think maybe if you just said this was a family dramedy and not at all a comedy, I could be a little bit more on board with it. But I just don't think it's funny. I didn't uh, when it came out 22 years ago, and I still do not. Um, I have a couple metaphors for you, if you don't mind. I certainly do not. I think that this movie is a wedding cake. I think it looks amazing, but is dry and flavorless. I think putting yourself (laughs) through watching this movie for an hour and 41 minutes would be like sitting on the floor and eating an entire wedding cake by yourself. It's a miserable experience, uh, even if you're starving. I also think another metaphor, the Tannenbaums as a family are white assless Kardashians. (laughs) <laughs> the do you think that Ange- yeah. you think that angelica houston is pimping her daughter out to get fucked on camera as well uh i Quite certainly a i certainly think she wouldn't but i think royal would strongly consider it he's oh, that kind of loving father um they're privileged they're dysfunctional 
Um, and anybody who relates to them has a glaring hole in their own soul. Uh, even as a fictional family, the Tannenbaums, it, they're like, they're hidden behind such a facade, just like the Kardashians. So under this wardrobe and this lighting and sort of distracting production design, everybody knows Wes Anderson makes beautiful movies. But sometimes I think it's to distract from the fact that the story and the characters are flat. Also, the Kardashians are completely interchangeable. And really, you could take all these characters and their performances, and they're extremely similar. Like, only Royal has a different energy than the rest of this cast. So, uh, yeah, I would say Royal is like uh, the Kardashians' mother, whatever her name is. And I think that if the Tannenbaums had butts, this movie would have made a lot more money. But nobody's ever going to talk about that. You're so right about them all having the same singular tone. It's like this uh, uh, craft services was provided by benzodiazepine and that only. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I almost got a spit. I almost got a spit take out of you. Awesome. Yeah, you got me. I Damn it! Go with that. Look at this. Look at me. You know, getting the guy to crack up and work the machine. I'm making places, making moves, mom. Yeah, man. Um, another metaphor argument for you. Um, I think that there's a difference in movie going experiences that certain people want. Some people want to feel smart. Some people want to be completely distracted. Some people want to be entertained. Some people want to think. I call this the hot tub versus the ice bath. Hot tubs are fun. <laughs> they're sexy. They're exciting. They're very social. You, you, when you think about it, you're like, this is going to be a good time. Ice baths are good for you. They're very good for your health. They get rid of all kinds of health problems, but they're unbearable. They're literally the whole idea of an ice bath is how long you can take it. I think the Royal Tannenbaums as a movie is an ice bath. Uh, I think for some people, they only feel good when they watch other people feeling bad. And that's exactly what this movie's for. I give Wes Anderson credit for in 2001, the internet was new. He didn't know how miserable everyone was going to get with social media. And this movie really has this great thing where it's like everybody on this movie is basically somebody you were friends with at Facebook before you deleted it. Somebody that <laughs> was just like, here's my problem. I'm quitting this business or the Ben Stiller Chaz character is like obsessed with selling. You know, he'd be an NFT guy. Um, I just find that this is an ice bath of a movie best watched in solitude. Sure. It might make you feel a little smarter, a little better about yourself, but personally I'd rather be in a hot tub and partying and having a good time when I watch movies. Right. No um, one's you're right. Sorry. Cause no one's fucking in an ice bath. Unless they you're a polar try, bear. Yeah. You gotta be really, really good to fuck in an ice bath. That I mean, is an impressive thing to do. You pretty much have to mainline Viagra in your dick because it's just gonna be the shrinkage and it's just you're swimming, you're swimming upstream to do that. There is nothing sexy about a Wes Anderson movie. The Royal Tannenbaums are all there's nothing sexy about it at all. It's like sitting in an ice bath by yourself and you're just waiting for it to be over. Um I think that people that really respond to this movie either relate to themselves and think them themselves as a Margot or they think to themselves as Richie, the bomber. I think that those are the two people that like this. They either sit in life and, and go, yeah, that's like me. And, and they think they were better than they were and gave it all up like Richie, or they just want to be stylish and sad and the constant victim like Margot. Um, mm. So I understand why people like it, but for me, that's not what I want from a movie um this one you probably knew what i was gonna say i feel like everybody's been waiting for me to say this but royal tannenbaums like all wes anderson movies are casually racist they're uh, they're about white people who are surrounded by funny and comical people of color usually that don't have very many lines uh or they're used as sight gags and going back and watching this last night i actually forgot how many times they'll cut to like Bill Murray's book cover uh, and Raleigh's book. Uh, and it's just like him standing, holding hands with the peculiar neurogenerative, gener the neurogenerative inhabitants of the Kazama atoll. And you're like, yeah, this is <laughs> like, he's just showing you how white the Tannenbaums are and the main cast. And then to make up for it, they just put Pagoda and the masseuse Sing Sing. And there's all these things in there. You're like, I don't know, man. It's pretty weird. Oh, and then when they go to the montage of everywhere Margot had been, I think there's her standing with like a guy with a full like flowery headdress and mask thing in Papua New Guinea. And I'm like, 
yeah, the whole joke is that the Tannenbaums are white and then there's this otherness to everybody else out in the world. I think if he had stopped with this movie, people wouldn't have noticed it. But then he kind of revealed himself as he kept making films and people started to be like, wait, this is a racist movie. Um, but yeah, the joke is basically seemingly look how white this family is and look how colorful these people of color are. And look at this hilarious contrast, which I don't know is the best message to give in a movie. Mm hmm. Um, I know a lot of film buffs love this movie and stylistically I understand why they think this is like a good movie or maybe even an important movie but if any of those people would claim that this movie is fun then they are admitting that they are not a fun person and but I, I have argue, a but I have a great sense of humor you don't know yes I would argue that there's no better movie in the history of American cinema than the Royal Tenenbaums to gauge whether somebody who thinks it's fun that instantly lets you know. It's a barometer to let you know that they are a not fun person to be around. Um, and I think that's why they're mag. I think they're drawn to it like Moss to a Flame because it's like these bland people are living stylized lives and interacting and, and seemingly have an interesting dynamic. And then they go, that's me. Deep down, they know it's them. They're the same uh, people that bring wheat thins to a Super Bowl party. Sure, or call or just yell sports all the time or sports right. ball or whatever. And it's like, yeah, it's the kind of people that are so consumed with their own problems that they don't want to go out and enjoy themselves with other people. Uh, and finally, I guess this is my last argument or my last bullet point. Uh, I think Wes Anderson should have stopped making movies after Royal Tenenbaums. I think the ascent from Bottle Rocket to Rushmore to Tannenbaums, if he had just stepped away and worked in a Barnes and Noble, like you said, or worked at a cereal factory, like I said, I think people would have been like, that was an incredible creative, like rocket ship. Like as the budgets got bigger, the movies got more beautiful. He made statements. He, and Rushmore is a legitimately funny movie. Mm. But I think he exposed himself as he kept going later and later. And now all my friends who love, who will say Rushmore, I mean, excuse me, the Tannenbaums or Rushmore, their favorite movie, are like hated the last three or four of these movies. Like they really are like let down by Wes Anderson. And I think what they don't realize is they liked it because 22 years ago, they were a different person than they are now. And they just hate to admit that it was never good to begin with. They so the just had uh, shittier taste. You're saying that there that Anderson is like the M Night Shyamalan of the Arcade Fire fan group. Yeah, that is a really <laughs> that is a great way to combine those things. Oh, thanks. I think he, if he had walked away after three, we would really be talking about him in a different way. But then after Isle of Dogs and Darjeeling Limited and many of his other films, even like. Uh, Steve Zizou, I heard is yeah. is loved. I've never seen that, but Life Aquatic is yeah. There's he does the same thing about being like light casually racist, and uh, you know the the irony of that is Royal is actually racist, and he's the most entertaining character about it. And it's okay to have a racist character. It's okay if that's a character's thing, but if the whole movie is doing these subtle things where it's just like putting people of color around them for a laugh. It's kind of a weird sense of humor. Um, and like I said to you, I'd never seen the end of this movie. I've tried to watch this movie to finish it probably five times, uh, including in theaters. So thank you, Kevin. I got to thank you for uh, encouraging <laughs> me or forcing me to, uh, now I can say I've seen it start to finish, beginning to end, and it doesn't change my opinion Um my one, the flowers I will give this movie, the one compliment I will give it is this will forever be the movie I will put on when I cannot sleep late at night and I need background. The Royal Tannenbaums will be my fall asleep movie. Anyone ever tell you you look like Val Kilmer without the voice cancer? Yeah, I used to get that a lot. When I was little, I used to get it. When I was uh, when I was a young guy, I used to get that a lot more than now. No. Yeah, I look like him in the snowman now. And that's fine. <laughs> Perfect. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> Give me a one to ten for the uh, for this film. I give it a four. Four, okay. I know it. It's hard to make a movie. It's hard to make a creative statement if you're a director that's also a writer. And they, there are a few good performances, but 
Yeah, I find it very dull and unwatchable. I, I It's surprising to me how loved this movie is. The Emperor's New Clothes aren't always seen by everybody. That's true. These notes brought to you by guttingthesacredcow.com, as I mentioned before, at GTSC Podcast. Thanks again for making us a part of your weekly routine where we invite guests to pick a film. I don't pick the film. The guests pick the film, even though you thank me profusely. You're the one who chose us, not me. To pick a film they find sure. overrated or hate and try to convince us to see their argument. But here's a twist. The film must meet one of these criteria. Why they beloved, critically acclaimed, or a financial success. Why did I say that? Because the YouTube algorithm needs to place this properly. Notes. Watching the, oh, I've got notes. Watching yeah, watching the opening shot of these three kids, I already know they're going to be eccentric, annoying assholes. <laughs> I'm yeah. supposed to believe that the dad shot his own son with a BB gun. Wait another 10 years when that dad gets drunk and says, driving a cabriolet is gayer than Richard Simmons teabagging Anderson Cooper. Okay. Okay. That's very colorful imagery. <laughs> Four, four minutes into this film, and I guarantee every hipster has either jizzed or squirted themselves with all this quirkiness. Definitely quirky is the number one uh, descriptor of this movie. People love to call this movie quirky. This is this looks like this watch is going to make for a long evening, despite being a scant hour and 47 minutes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Falconry seems fun. I would train my falcons to attack any bag of queefs that talks on their cell phone while standing on subway stairs. Ooh. Are you in New York City? Are you a New Yorker? I work in the city. I, I live in Jersey. Yeah. Yeah. That is, I remember that well. And the people that hold the phone on um, speaker in the stairwells, that's even like another tier. That's another 20% horrifying. Yeah, we all know you're from Ohio without saying that you're from Ohio. We get it. <laughs> Owen Wilson, Owen Wilson, excuse me, is irksome in everything I've seen him in except Midnight in Paris. Irksome is also a word that I would use when I get an accidental boner in public. That's right. Boner in public, by the way, sister store to Banana Re Republic. <laughs> Probably sell pretty well these days. Yeah. This feels like a writing contest to create the outlandish, most outlandish, eccentric characters having wacky escapades that elicit zero laughter. I agree. Oh, I agree. wow. Thank you. Oh, wow. Finally, people wearing track suits that aren't Italian or Polish? Gutsy call, Wes Anderson. Gutsy call. <laughs> I paused it at 14 minutes and 28 seconds, took a deep breath and said, Fuck, another 90 minutes. Me too. When I wrote the, the my second bullet point, I was like, I paused. I was like, hour and 41 minutes? I was like, what the fuck is going to happen? It was a long haul. Did I mention these characters are insanely unique, but also devoid of charm and humor? Did I say that already? I might have. No, but I like that. Are we supposed to engage in knee-slapping laughter because Luke Wilson looks like Jimmy Connors, Owen Wilson, is dressed like Woody from Toy Story. Gwyneth Paltrow looks like a Wiccan who cuts herself while playing Letters to Cleo songs. Is that why people find this so gut-bustingly funny? That's right. And I think I made a similar point. Is It's like you're, you're putting one character in different outfits. It's the same thing. It's mm -hmm. the same character. This whole movie feels like a sweat bit. So for those of you who don't know comedy, a sweat bit is where a comic does something exaggerated, like speaking quickly or tongue twisters like, to get a laugh that's not material-based. This whole movie has felt like one big sweat bit so far. I shudder to think on all these critics' five-star reviews will look. Wes Anderson can bring back Uncle Phil from Fresh Prince from the Dead, put a gimp mask on him, and walk him like a dog around the West Village, and the critics will give him the palm d'or at Khan. Promise you. That's Correct. how much he's loved. The music in this film is as insufferable, insufferable as Gwyneth Paltrow naming her kid Apple. Yeah. Did Owen Wilson steal John Voight's wardrobe from Midnight Cowboy or Jim Carrey's from Dumb and Dumber? I wish he stole their humor as well. Mm. <laughs> please don't try. Please don't try and tell me I, that I don't get this film. 
Because I get that this storyline is as, as appealing as sitting in short traffic on a July afternoon with your gas tank on empty. God, yes. Why would Ben Stiller name his kid Uzi like the gun? It's really tough having such a street name as a first name when you're sporting a tracksuit and a Jufro. Absolutely. This family of dildos has worn out my patience completely. <laughs> Every one of these characters' journey hopefully ends with the ritual killing in the Port Authority bathrooms. Yes. Almost did. I kind of, uh, I'm going to dovetail with your, with your point before. Gene Hackman is the Upper West Side bad Santa. I did smirk at that. Yeah. Liked him, I like him. That. I like I thought so, too. I like him just doing some fun stuff, taking the kids out, you know, not having this old CD thing about training to do fire drills. Like, this is, again, this quirky shit. It's just going to fall on deaf ears with yours truly. Yeah, man. That montage got me to the end of the movie. Without that montage, I do not think I could have made it all the way through. You know who the best character is in this movie after Gene Hackman? Danny Glover. Mm-hmm. I enjoyed his repartee with Hackman. Me but too. if you're a fan of this podcast, you know I've got this queued up. A That doesn't happen. When Danny Glover calls up to get Gene Hackman's medical history, you just don't hand that out to some random caller. That doesn't happen. Correct. This is labeled as a comedy. I need the chapter and verse examples where the funny parts are. Because if you say to me, I want you to tell me my favorite film is Caddyshack. Funniest film of all time. I can give you 85 examples. I can give you 115 from The Naked Gun. I want mm -hmm. you to give me these verses, chapter and verse of what was Laughter eliciting. Next. Oh, there we go. Hey, it's good to hear Alec Baldwin do voiceover. This is a surefire way he can't accidentally kill a prop master with a loaded gun while he's in the voiceover booth. Oh, so dark. So dark. <laughs> and true. <laughs> true. This whole brother in love with his sister angle hasn't even come close to paying off, and they've beaten that dead horse multitude of times oh i'm sorry owen wilson was the neighbor not him so luke wilson and owen wilson both pining for whatevs here's a hypothesis for you bill murray's study subject will turn out to be either a serial killer sex trafficker or a screenwriter for royal tenenbaums 2 yes the 375th street ymca ah that's cute because there is no 375th Street in New York City. Excuse me while I fall out of my chair with laughter. That, <laughs> that's some real naked gun shit we got going on here, folks. Speaking of Bill Murray, he is wasted in this hipster horseshit. Definitely. They could have rang up um, Richard Dreyfus for that same exact role and achieved the same exact intended consequences. Yes. If you give me seven bourbons in 20 minutes and then you put Jake Gyllenhaal and Luke Wilson next to each other, I promise you I could not tell them apart. <laughs> Hour and 17 minutes in, it feels like two and a half hours. Yes. I Same Googled experience. The, I Googled to see if this is outlawed in the Geneva Convention. It's not. <laughs> yet. Just like real life, if Gwyneth Paltrow made a candle out of her pussy, this film would get a lot more interesting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Again, the incest through line. Did Wes Anderson have some Oedipal lust for his mother? And if so, he should be shot in the hand with a BB gun. Yet again, another film I would actually pay money to see with a primarily black audience. The commentary would be priceless. I I'll leave it at, I will leave it at that. Oh, good. The Falcon return. Glad to see that callback. Oh. By the way, if I am Luke Wilson holding onto that Falcon, I'm shitting my pants the entire time because I'm deathly afraid of being pecked to death for yes. whatever reasons. I don't know. I wish someone at this in this film would have said the words diplomatic immunity so then Danny Glover could pull a gun out and shoot all the Tenenbaums and saying <laughs> has just been revoked. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. People quote the Tenenbaums. I will quote Lethal Weapon 2. Yeah. Ad nauseum. Better mover. Yeah, better movie. Uh, actually, better than the first. I can make that argument. Yep. Owen Wilson painting his face like the ultimate warrior made me smirk. Oh, good. So he's doing cocaine now. That With that nose of his, it must be like an industrial-sized shop vacuum. Because he could sniff the perfume of his next-door neighbor's wife with that schnoz. Mm -hmm. 
What did we learn in the end? The dad's an asshole and comes to terms with that and tries to make everything right. Oh, how many films have we seen that in? Let me think. Huh. What journey did everyone else end up on? Well, we got Gwyneth Paltrow. Is in, everyone's in love with goth Gwyneth Paltrow and her nine and a half fingers. Okay. What else was so funny about her? Her wacky taste of dude that she's dated. Eclectic? Yep. Funny? Nope. This whole movie is a complete bag of who gives a shit. The entire movie was just an exercise to have weird characters say and do weird shit, but I could not enjoy any of it. I despise quirky, nerdy, in quotes, comedies like these. Yes, they label this a comedy. This sh- this is libelous, my friend. I tried to come up this with an open mind. I, too, saw this pretty much right when it hit dvd 20 some years yeah. ago and i turned it off i said no yeah. thank you turned it right the fuck off but this as of course i would sit through every piece of shit film that some guests make me watch and i said let me come in with an open mind 20 years later i'm in my later 40s now let's see where this ends up i hated every second of this film the cinematography is solid beautifully shot the colors pop undeniable oh, yes. beautiful <laughs> beautiful <laughs> yeah. If you've heard every episode of this podcast, you know I've despised the following films. The Rocky Horror Picture Show, Napoleon Dynamite, 2001 A Space Odyssey, Hell. I even sat in that gutter seat and decided to just debunk why A Christmas Story is a piece of shit, as well as The Princess Bride. Fucking terrible. Let's add this film to the list that I cannot stand. No, I'm not going to see you at a Strokes concert because you like this film because we'll never cross paths again. This is pretentious tomfoolery that I refuse to engage in. I will never unfriend anyone based on their opinions or views, but if you love this movie, I'll never respect your taste, and I probably don't respect you. Fuck this film. It is a one and a half out of ten for me, only because it is beautifully shot, the character is very unique. I will give style points for that. Otherwise, I fucking hate this film. <laughs> you really the, do. You do more than me. The surprise <laughs> of people who know me, like, yeah, there's no way you're going to like this one. So we agree, but we not agree as on a lot, lot of the fronts, too. Like it, what you were saying right at the top, one of your first notes for that, it was a note that I had in uh, as well, where you could take this movie. Um, I almost feel like if you took this movie out of Wes Anderson's film canon, film history, and you took all his other movies, and then you had AI write a movie, it would be Wes Anderson AI would be the Royal Tannenbaums. I actually think it's just such a straight fastball of like, if you like Wes Anderson, this is your masterpiece. Everybody loves this one. But to me, it's like, it's, I don't know. It, It was a very flat experience. I soulless that, yeah oh spot like a on. robot wrote it it was had lacked all soul and i've seen more emotion at the no t1 th- i've seen more emotion at the t1000 and terminator 2 than i did with this film yes at least he did a finger waggle at shred uh L- lyndon hamilton when she he emptied the shock in her yeah he was pissed let's see oh sharpen those knives critics because you know they're going to come slash anyone who disagrees with this here are some critics five star reviews A family who seemingly has it all. A large collection of parents, siblings, children, all under the same roof. And yet every single one of them, even Royal, still feels like an outsider. Why is that good? That's a five-star review? Copy and pasted. Crazy. That's not a good review. Nope. Underneath the film's ornate but terse facade might be a churning tangle of backstories barely hinted at. Again. That it should be a one star review, maybe two star. Yeah. The wonderfully eclectic soundtrack, boy, I hated this music, helps distract from the film's occasional flatness, as does an A list cast. Again, not a five star review. Well, it's funny because you mentioned the music too. The one, the music that distracted me the most that maybe you wrote a note about was like the Charlie Brown Christmas piano that would occasionally play. And yes. that is so, that's to me such pandering of like, oh, you're going to feel something. You were, a, you were a child once. And I'm like, okay, all right. Yeah. 
someone's trying to dig deep in the nostalgia trough, but guess what? I'm not eating your slop. That's right. The fact that Royal Tenenbaums is able to maintain a whimsical tone coupled with profound moments of hurt and loss and then still have the audacity to be an outright hilarious movie elevates it to something sensational. Nope. Disagree. I would love to do something to... I would love this person to get two flat tires on the on the LA Expressway, on the 5. How about that? They would crack up laughing. That would be right. sensational it's, if that happened oh, to them. It's, it's, it would be hysterical. It's, it's sensational. Yeah. Uh, it is also whimsical. Mm. Oh, gross. Critics <laughs> one star reviews. There is so much to like about Wes Anderson's work, and it's hard to not hard not to warm to a guy who makes a comedy about damaged young has-beens, but he misfires badly in some crucial respects. I guess you can say the same about Red Dawn. I don't know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The reboot, not the original. I'm just kidding. Yeah. The never saw the reboot <laughs> and the original, not good either. Did on this very podcast. This these uh, sorry these characters are written with the broad strokes of caricature, yet they are neither funny nor, in the end, sympathetic. Great, true. Anderson may yet be the heir to the screwball comedy throne, but his creative blood needs a fresh infusion. Let's what? just. Thank you. Let's just address that. This is why anyone who's an American lit major in college right now, I just want you to say, you know what? Either stop taking mommy and daddy's money and spending 55000 a year plus to, you know, or going on loans and just do a hard pivot because no one's going to respect you in life. Especially when, you, especially when you say this is a screwball comedy because the top of my head, let's see what you have, but I'll give you five screwball comedies. How about Animal House? Sure. Dumb and Dumber. Ace Ventura, Naked Gun, uh, King Tommy Lee, Boy, Tommy Boy, sure. All the Sandler films, are Water Boy, Happy yeah. Gilmore is a screwball. Caddyshack, yeah. Animal House, goddamn it! This is anything but a screwball, nor a comedy. I mean, Bridesmaids is a screwball comedy, and it, sure. it works. <laughs> it's great. Uh, I put them in the same category of screwball comedy as The Artist. Okay. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> the artist. Oh my God. I totally forgot that existed. Guess what? Everybody else did because 90% of the films that win Best Picture, no one's going to remember. Hey, remember Moonlight? Yeah, no one else has seen that since, right? No. Time to submit a writing packet to you. I'm hitting all my uh, keynotes. Yeah. The Royal Tenenbaums tries to be many things, but isn't any one thing forcefully. Oh, sorry, I butchered that reading. But isn't any one thing forcefully enough to carry much weight or significance? I agree. Amazon, five-star reviews. I absolutely get all the reasons why a person wouldn't like this film, and that's completely fine. I don't think I'm somehow better or part of this pretentious in-crowd, in quotes. I do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Truth be told, when I saw this in the theater in 2002, I didn't like it for most of the reasons people have said. Then something happened when I watched this a year later. I loved it. I loved it irrationally. I loved it so much I thought it was in need of help because I couldn't understand why. For almost a year, I watched it nearly every night. When it came on here, I watched with wow. glee, pausing often to examine the details of each scene, i.e. Ethelene's many suitors montage. Guys, I would rather watch Rebel Wilson have an episiotomy than watch this film every night. Every night? My God. Yeah, I mean, if I have to watch, this will be my go-to-sleep movie. Like I said, this right. is like, I'm going to take a, a gummy and watch this movie, and I'll be hopefully asleep before Mordecai flies. <laughs> it's like my bu my buddy used to say back in the day, when you ever bring a girl back to her house, he goes, I ever bring a girl back to the house to watch a movie, it's always Rain Man, and I'm in her pants by the time the Ferrari hits the ground. Oh, my God. <laughs> what a choice. <laughs> Rain Man. Yeah. All right. This is this is a few years ago that he made this statement. Yeah. Not not exactly like he's made this in 2016. Now I find myself in a similar position to the Tenenbaum kids, deciding to make an effort to have someone in your life and defining what that role is, despite the fact they are deeply flawed and unlikely to change. I understand the calculus. This film genuinely helps me pr process some of those feelings 
And maybe it will speak to you in the same way. Did this asshole just say calculus? Holy shit. I wish this a cab would hit this person with a pothole filled with water in, G- in the middle of January and just give them that <laughs> cold shower, that cold tub we talked about 45 minutes ago. They need this kind of uh, wake up. Yep. Love that it's a cri- love that it's a great Christmas movie for the fam. 4000. Signed Andre 3000. Again, just because the just because of the Charlie Brown soundtrack, there's no other nod to Christmas, right? Right. Okay. Good review. Smart. The more I see this film, the more I like it. This movie hit close to home. Like Royal Tenenbaum, my mother was often a lousy parent. That's right. And then tried to make up for it at the end of her life. I also got to see a lot of my father-in-law in Royal. Signed, Cat Middleton. That's right. That that is the fan of this thing. And like yeah. I said, it's the Margos and the Richies. It's the people that are like, I was my childhood sucked. I was a Margot or a Richie. That's uh, that's that is who loves this movie. Amazon one star reviews. Okay. It's imbecilic, narcissistic, childish, and boring. The characters are one dimensional. No motives or nuances are shown or implied, except insofar as they fall into the above categories. Even the clothing and sets are offensive. The colors are jarring and annoying. The sets are weird, ugly to no purpose other than idiosyncrasy. idiosyncrasy. The dialogue offers nothing. The facial expressions are zombie-like. There is no, likewise, sure. real humor in the script nor characters. There is no social contacts in the characters. Don't buy this movie. It's a downer. It makes one mad that it makes one mad that money and effort goes into such idiocies and that we are expected to like it, even love it, and praise it as art that people actually praise it on Amazon and thus get people to purchase it. Thousands of films, books, and products are praised on Amazon that are worthless. This is one of them. Signed, Tracy Morgan. The Tracy Morgan got in there. I didn't know he was so verbose when it came to typing up reviews. Especially about the Royal Tenenbaums, you know. Dude, hates it. I guess he wrote this while he was laying in a hospital bed when Walmart was paying him. (laughs) Bravo, Wes Anderson. Your silver spoon shines dimly once more, cater- catering to intellectuals such as yourself who clearly know the struggles of a pampered, uppercut upbringing. Your lack of originality is, and the format of actors you use in this film is akin to beating a dead horse slowly to emo folk music. In essence, this is a film. This is a this film is a delight for fart sniffers on high horses. That's a great band. Have you checked them out recently? Fart sniffers on high yeah, horses. They rip. They Dude, rip. Their, their new stuff is amazing. But but personally, I don't want to waste any of my time on this pretentious, depressing kind of BS ever again. Signed, Cardi B. Oh, there you go. (laughs) Throwing her hat in the ring. Cannot, could not stand the voice of Alec Baldwin as a narrator. Signed, Kim Basinger. Well, that makes plenty of sense. That makes a lot of sense. Gene Hackman and Angelica Houston are big, and I think Hackman owes me a favor for that lunch I bought him at In-N-Out Burger last week when he forgot, in quotes, his wallet. How do you that's bury royal. that lead? That's royal. That's, that's so royal. royal. That's, that's so the, royal. That's a new spinoff besides that, the creators from, from the creators of That's So Raven comes. That's so royal. I would watch that. It, the I mean, royal is the only interesting character in this movie. So it is good. It's called the Royal Tannenbaums because royal actually does have layers and he's going through something. But even he doesn't get like a full redemption. It's it's just fascinating. It's a fascinating yeah. movie. Yeah. He he, apl- you know, he helps out uh, Danny Glover in the end and gets the official divorce. whoop de doo Yeah. Now, let's just torture the audience for only three jokes because... Me, Kevin Goatee, is 29-0 and 0 against Chat GPT. Let's see if that streak continues. Okay. Why did Royal Tenenbaum become a tennis coach? Because he wanted to serve his family problems right onto the court. Okay. Okay. What's in... <laughs> that's what okay. you say in the writer's room when someone just pitches a dog shit joke. Like, okay, that's an, uh, that's an idea. It's a Tenenbaum level joke. Right. Yep. What did Margot Tenenbaum say when asked about her secret talent? I can vanish from family, family gatherings faster than you can say adopted. Pretty good. That would get a laugh. It ends on a hard D sound. Somebody would laugh at that. D, C, or K. That, those are the magic words. That That's right. Like. How does Chaz Tenenbaum calm himself down during a stressful day? He counts his red Adidas track suit, track suits instead of sheep. I mean, also the guy bred Dalmatian mice. You could have probably gone that direction and gotten something more. But that's fine. That's fine. 
I think that Hollywood Street coming to the end is just the best of news because ChatGPT will be nowhere near of taking work from all you hardworking writers, definitely actors, true. and directors. <laughs> Since I'm the only one on this podcast, I will say, Scotty Landis, you did help indeed got the sacred cow. Well, I will also you. say, well, listen, I will also say that this film hung itself on its own entrails because it yes. is dog shit terrible. All you did was just kind of Look in its mouth, open it wide, and just sneeze some diphtheria into that throat and uh, let nature take its course. I've been thinking about it for 20 years, so thank you for the opportunity because <laughs> I, I was so confused. And I I have two friends who swear that this is their favorite movie or one of their favorite movies, and one of them works for the CIA, and the other one is a very funny person, like a performer and actor. And uh, it blows my mind every time because I've given this one so many chances and it was nice to definitively go, no, nah, I don't think this works. At least not for me. Uh, and I, and then I would say to Michael McKeon, you need to have yourself readjusted, Michael, because this just isn't funny. That was my guess. You're a famous person. I don't know. I just want to throw a name out there and try and go for a laugh. You know, oh, what? I love that, him. That one didn't land. God damn it. I'm still bad at 850. I'll take my bows. Kevin Goatee, Scotty Land is saying thanks a bunch. We'll see you next week. Avita Zen.